This episode today, guys, is one that was really poignant for me. And I say this in all honesty because the week when I was recording this episode, I was actually really suffering with anxiety. I was suffering with so many intrusive thoughts, worries, panic. This podcast really helped me at the end of it. Now, we have a really thorough deep dive in today's episode. For me, pinpointing where the guilt and shame has been constructed is really helpful. More therapy than hot dinner, so I can pinpoint a lot of mine. The therapist is there for you, you're not there for the therapist. As soon as you start having feelings like, I feel like I'm disappointing my therapist, one, tell them, and two, if you feel like it's a feeling that doesn't go away, try a different therapist. If you suffer with anxiety, or you know anyone who suffers with anxiety, this episode will be worth its value in gold, because we really do dive deep into what is anxiety and how can we actually take control of it. It's something that really resonated with me when Joshua told me that actually we shouldn't fear anxiety. We need to sit and we need to accept how we're feeling. And I think so many times we panic or we worry when we're feeling unnerved. In this episode, we look at risk factors for anxiety, we touch on social anxiety, the common beliefs that people have which just aren't true. We dive into vulnerability porn where so many times we're searching for an answer on Google and we can be misinformed because we feel quite vulnerable in that moment. Things about boundaries, information seeking, reassurance seeking and what is metacognitive therapy. There is so much in this episode and I couldn't have been joined by a better guest because Joshua Fletcher is a qualified psychotherapist and UK top anxiety expert. His aim is to bring psychoeducational to the masses and break the taboo associated with mental health. He has amassed over 175,000 followers on Instagram and is the author of three best-selling books and also hosts a very popular panic and anxiety podcast, The Panic Pod. So get ready to feel reassured by the end of this episode that actually you are okay and you do have this. Josh, welcome to Live Well, Be Well for the second time, may I just say. Thank you so much for coming back to record this after a huge technical failure last time. (laughs) No, thanks. Good to be back. I realised that you and and the team enjoyed it so much the first time around that you had to do uh, a second episode. (laughs) Nothing to do with technical errors. (laughs) Nothing to do with technical. And that's the reason why we record a lot in person. I feel like I'm learning my lessons slowly but surely. For any of our listeners who is wondering what we're talking about, Josh and I did a fantastic hours long episode last week to then figure out there was a huge technical failure. So I'm very appreciative of you coming back on today. And I know that you are incredibly busy writing a new book that's coming out next year, as well as all of the work that you do on Instagram, which had a huge boom during COVID, and also your therapy that you also see patients. So we've got a lot to discuss today. I feel like we've already had a little bit of an anxious morning trying to make sure we're not gonna have another technical failure. So I'm ready to talk all things anxiety with you today oh wonderful <laughs> that's great that's my uh, that's a topic of specialty so. <laughs> so Josh I always kick off the podcast with the same question to all my guests which is what have you changed your mind about the most in the last 10 years and I'm going to ask for one quick answer if possible a choice of poor haircut every month I decide to change it and it's just still mediocre to poor well that's what you've changed your mind about yeah, every time every time I go to the barbers, I get that anxiety around, do I st- stick or twist? And if I stick or twist, I always end up losing. So, yeah. There's so many things I could come back with, but I'm trying not to. I'm going to keep it clean on this podcast. So, stick or twist on the on the haircut decision of the last 10 years. That's a different one. That's not what I thought you were going to say. I change my answer each time. <laughs> that's, that's, that's thought I, thought I thought you were going to say something really profound about taking control of anxiety, because that is what you have done of your life of the last 10 years, haven't you? You've really grasped the concept of actually what anxiety is. And now you're delivering that to thousands of people through all of your social media channels. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I would say, like, I I never change my mind with it. I'm very, as someone who suffered with anxiety in the past, diagnosed with panic disorder and OCD, I come out the other side in a good place. And yeah, I, I like to think that my mind's made up on kind of where I where I sit with anxiety now you know don't hate it don't get angry at it anymore I can I take it with me and paradoxically it disappears when I allow it to be there 
And that is something that I think many of us can fight, especially me, if I feel anxious, I fight the feeling quite a lot because it is an uncomfortable feeling when anxiety occurs, but actually you've learned to just sit and accept it. And that seems to be the power of it for you, of grasping the understanding. Yeah, it's kind of, but I don't really use the word acceptance. I find a lot of anxious people don't like the word acceptance because it's, you know, why would I accept something that feels like trash? You know, if you've got anxiety, whether it's conventional anxiety, which is I'm worried about things external from me, I'm worried about, you know, work, first date, my family, bills, my career, or if you've got the inwards disordered anxiety, which a lot of people struggle with, which is panic attacks, intrusive thoughts, anxious compulsive behaviors, avoiding um, strange symptoms. People don't really want to accept that, uh, but I borrow the term willful tolerance from high profile psychotherapists um, called Sally Winston and Mike Seif, and they use this term willful tolerance. Like, I'm gonna go and meet my friends at that social events and willfully tolerate the discomfort. I'm gonna drive on the motorway even though it makes me anxious and willfully tolerate that discomfort. I'm gonna do a talk in front of my colleagues and willfully tolerate that discomfort. Uh, I'm a bit anxious now even doing this and it's, I'm willfully tolerating it. But like you said, as soon as you start fighting it and trying to wish it to go away and throwing everything at it, you actually signal to the brain that anxiety itself and stress itself is dangerous and it starts to kind of snowball. So yeah, I spent a lot of time in that realm fighting and trying to fix, trying to find the miracle cure, constantly self-analyzing, checking for anxiety, scared of panic attacks, avoiding places because I'd have a panic attack, overanalyzing and ruminating on intrusive thoughts. And basically all my focus was inwards. But by willfully tolerating, you know, I realized, well, I'll tolerate all this uncertainty and I'm gonna get on with what non-anxious me would do. Because anxious people stop doing what non-anxious them, them would do. It would affect their day-to-day -day life, affects their relationships, their career, whatever. And I'm just really, really passionate about saying like, well, do what non-anxious you would do, but take that feeling with you and watch what happens. I think that's a really powerful term, isn't it, actually? If you take the fear away, what is achievable and what actually can you grasp? And now before we dissect, you mentioned so many great different forms there of anxiety. And I think many people might not be aware that there's different interpretations of anxiety and I really want to dissect into that but before we do I just want to focus a little bit on you and hopefully that's not going to make you too anxious hopefully you can tolerate this part of it but I find that your journey has been <laughs> fascinating <clears throat> and especially obviously you know our introductory call we spoke a little bit about your life and then last week we really did uncover kind of your childhood and, and your own journey into where you are now. And I think it's really inspiring, one, just to see that you've kind of taken control and not by overcoming it, but actually grasping it and using it to opportunity to say, well, actually, I'm going to figure this out for myself, which can feel very overwhelming. And then I'm going to lend that to the world and explain what I went through and how people can actually do it themselves. So you grew up in Manchester. That's currently where you are living now, isn't it? And that's where your therapy room is. So can you tell me a little bit about your childhood, actually? Can you tell me a little bit about your journey, where you grew up, what your family dynamic was like? Did you suffer with anxiety back then or OCD, the things that you just mentioned? Or did you only become aware of that later on in life? Could you talk to me a little bit about your, your childhood? Yeah, I've, I've always been a worrier. It's, you know, I think being a worrier is actually kind of a strength because it means you analyse and you can prepare and that caution can stop you from being lackadaisical or gung-ho into certain things. I don't see that worrier as weakness or anything like that. Um, but as growing up, yeah, I was a bit of a worrier. I had very neurodivergent traits, particularly things like, if you ever heard of things like stimming, um, it's associated with um, the autistic spectrum and OCD, which is known to be neurodivergent. I, I kind of had those traits as a kid, but it never really stopped me from learning or making friends or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, I went to, I grew up in, some, in a rough school, like a really rough school. I kind of had to adapt to that. And that, that comes with its own conventional anxiety. I grew up in a very poor area with my mum. She raised me on her own and my brother. That comes with its own kind of difficulties. Um, it has its own kind of, its own culture growing up on the council estate. Some great people there, though. You know, and I'm not one of these people that, you know, oh, I grew up on a council estate. Yeah, you know, yeah, I did. It was rough, but, you know, I, I learned lots and I wouldn't change it for the world. Yeah, so I grew up like that. Then I went to college, did all right at school, went to college, and then went to university, and I went far away. For, you know, I studied in Bath, 
I had more again of that conventional anxiety where I used to care about what I looked like. Would I get pour all my attention into how much you know, uh, attention I get from other people, whether it was friendships or relationships or just wanting to feel like a like important. But yeah, I finished my degree, and then it was after that when disordered anxiety started to to, to begin. So when I finished university, my little brother was diagnosed with a very rare form of liver cancer and he was 14, he was stage four, and so I became his carer. Uh, so it was my mum and me were looking after him, trips to Manchester Children's Hospital there and back. I really got on my brother with a seven year age gap and it kind of broke my heart. But also it sent my threat response uh, bananas. Not immediately. I was working as well at the time, I was working in a pupil referral unit. So that's like a school for children who can't access mainstream education. Uh, usually kids that have been expelled or have complex needs. And so that was a stressful job. Great job, by the way. Loved it. But, you know, I had the stressful job when I was there. And then I came home to care for my brother. And suddenly, you know, I started, you know, the stress was building up. I always used the uh, concept of the stress jug or a stress flask. And this was building up. I'd just come out of a relationship at the time. So that was in the stress jug as well extra grief on top of complex grief that you get with a terminal cancer diagnosis of a loved one and just quit smoking a lot of cannabis um which didn't help i was addicted to it okay what anyone says it's very addictive to some people with that disposition probably wasn't eating well probably drinking too much and then one day when i was in work at the pupil referral unit i felt quite wired all of a sudden usually I, in the morning i'm terrible so i woke up in the morning i was like why do i feel awake like really awake, this is unusual. And I went to work and yeah, I was making a cup of tea and then suddenly I think I dropped a spoon on the side and my whole body just went poof, like everything just changed. Everything looked weird. Uh, I didn't know what was going on. I now know what was going on, it was fine. But at the time everything just suddenly looked weird. I felt detached. I felt like I was in the matrix. My hands didn't feel like mine. It's called dissociation or derealization. I didn't know that at the time. I didn't even use the word anxiety. Uh, I just thought it meant nervousness. I froze. Everything looked strange. My voice didn't sound like mine. People came into the room and their faces looked like clay. Uh, and when I explain this a lot to kind of my clients or my followers on, on Instagram, they're like, oh my God, there's a word for that? I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's called derealization. But at the time, I didn't know what was going on. I was actually having a, an enormous panic attack. I thought panic attacks were like you see on Netflix where you're rolling around and you know, flashbacks of horrible thing. No, it was just a complete and utter breakdown. And I was really worried. I thought I'd lost my mind. I thought I was losing my mind and this was it. And this was my reality forever. And it really, really made me unwell. I rang my mum and she came to pick me up. And I spent days in my bedroom trying to fix myself, trying to work out what was going on with me. I mean, if you type that into Google now, you get lots, but this was like, 10 years ago where it wasn't wasn't as much information on it and yeah I was really unwell wouldn't leave the bathroom I developed agoraphobia couldn't like walk to the end of my garden and bear in mind I was a confident guy at this point like, you know I did drama stand-up comedy all these things I loved public speaking and stuff like that I was always been quite a confident person but when the kind of anxiety hit the anxiety disorder and all these strange things that were just so alien to me yeah I just thought you know that was quite difficult and then my brother was Poorly as well on top of that so I had this internal critic going well why are you being so selfish you know your brother's dying and you you know that and that did that didn't help anything either cut the long story short I psychoeducation saved my life so I discovered the works of like Dr. Claire Weeks and similar similar books there's a guy, well, one called um, by Paul David where someone actually explained to me what the hell was going on because I thought I was broken, I went to the doctors, had all this medication, all this stuff, it just made me feel worse. And that's not to say it makes everyone feel worse, but for me it did. Yeah, I found out that this is something called um, panic disorder or an anxiety disorder. And reading that for the first time, reading that I wasn't crazy and that this is okay, gave me such the biggest sense of relief in my life. And I wanted to capture that feeling that I had about 10 years ago and share it with other people. And I think that's kind of what, why my social media took off during lockdown and things like that. It's because what I say isn't, you know, it's just educational, psychoeducational or not. 
telling you empty platitudes about you know what you know you see in wellness culture and stuff like that. But I, I just thought, yeah, I just teach people what's happening in their brains. What really helped me was just that I got a load of adrenaline on board, loads of cortisol on board. My nervous system's jacked up. You know, all these symptoms are because of adrenaline and cortisol. Everything looks weird because when you're really anxious, there's a delay in the signal in your brain, so everything is perceived like you're high, and even though you're not. Learning that was really helpful. And so then I left that, started studying psychology, uh, did my master's in counseling psychology, then further did uh, some studying in CBT, and became a, a, a counselor, and that's what I do today. I'm a teacher, counselor, psychotherapist, whatever you want to call it, just a buff in on his soapbox teaching you about anxiety. So yeah, there's a, an A to Z of how I got you. <laughs> Thank you, first of all, just for sharing that story, because you speak about it now so well, but I can still imagine just how traumatizing it is to just reference so many of those moments and the sheer fear that you went through there's probably a lot yeah. of people listening to this like whether it's to the extent that you went through or people live with this underlining chronic anxiety that I think people now just feel that actually that's just how I live my life day to day hearing that I think can give a lot of people hope and even after our recording last week you know I've definitely had some anxious moments in the last week and I'm just trying to remember to myself, like, actually, this is this is okay, and this will pass, and not trying to fight it. And it's interesting. I feel like you actually gave yourself some time to try and just understand it. Yeah. When you understand anxiety fully, it's for its whole purpose. You soon realize very quickly that a lot of kind of wellness culture and, and advice that you see about anxiety is so counterproductive and not helpful at all. So, you know, you've read it all about, you know, how five ways to get rid of a panic attack. Well, you can't, science wins there. You can't get rid of a panic attack. Nothing's actually attacking you. You're having an adrenaline rush, you know, and that applies to high anxiety too. You can't just switch anxiety off, you know, like anxiety busting techniques. It's like, no, you leave it alone. Obviously, if you've got actual anxiety, as in, in response to a real threat, because you've got to remember anxiety is a threat response, then yeah, act upon it. But if you've got that disordered, stress-induced anxiety that you know is just firing off irrationally, then that's the more stuff that you leave alone. Because when we become stressed, the threat response becomes confused. So, you know, it's the same threat response our ancestors had. It was great for them. You know, you're walking across the Serengeti, there's a pride of lions. What you need is a doubt response, a threat response, which makes us the most powerful predators in, in, in existence is to go oh I'm doubting my safety so I'm just going to look around and see if there's any danger oh yeah there's some lions let's walk around it you know let's let's not kill the, that or kill them when they're asleep or whatever combining the intelligent human brain with a threat response a doubt response is the biggest kind of weapon humankind's had to survive Doubting your safety. I doubt I'll sleep well tonight because it's cold. Well, I'll build a shelter. I doubt that this jungle is safe, so I'm going to look above for snakes. You know, I doubt that cave is safe. What if a bear comes out? Well, I'm going to take out my spear and just in case the bear runs out, you know, I'm going to, you know, sock it one. But that response has never evolved. So you have this sat at your office desk. You have this raising children. You have this response that's redundant when you're driving a vehicle sat on an airplane you're like i feel that same doubt that my ancestors had but what makes it weird is that the threats aren't there anymore the threats are modern and subjective so they could be like well there's a threat to people not liking me there's a threat to my career there's a threat to my health um, my general health my lifestyle and what I teach my clients to play is that, yeah, that response has never evolved over thousands of years. Yeah, it can be annoying, but it's actually a building block to what makes you you. And sometimes it will start to fire off unnecessarily, like mine did when I had my breakdown. And just recovery is about teaching the brain that, you know, okay, you fired off, you're trying to look after me, but now I'm going to show you you're not needed here. And that's by like what you've just said, Sarah. Like kind of almost like let it, letting it be in there, not fighting it, not arguing with it, not even listening to it sometimes. You get a lot of people like, listen, what's it saying? 
do you mean, no, some, I don't do that because I have OCD or intrusive thoughts. You know, what's it saying? It's like nonsense, 99% nonsense. <laughs> Most thoughts are just rubbish, you know, and it's like, it's up to you to decide whether or not they're important or not. Yeah, that's kind of why you've got to be careful about getting rid of the horrible feeling that is anxiety too quickly because then you teach the brain actually anxiety itself is something to be feared. Someone told me once, he was a, a friend of mine, he was a psychiatrist, and I remember going through a really anxious moment. I think I was in lockdown, and I think there was part of it where, you know, you're worried financially about running a charity and how you can fund that, and I remember also being really worried about the fashion industry because everything stopped for six months, and we were like, is that, I've got a mortgage to pay. So all of these kind of like things start coming into your mind, going, I don't feel like I can take any actionable control right now because we're physically locked down and everything's just stopped. So what can I do? And I remember really suffering then with anxiety. And this is interesting to ask you if you think this works, but the five senses. And I think it's something like you stop and all you focus on is what can you hear? What can you smell? What can you taste? What can you touch? And it just tries to bring your focus and your mind actually just into the present to like nothing else that's going on. And I found that actually a really helpful tool that I think when I get anxious, I can just kind of spiral quite quickly. And you kind of just actually, you kind of just go a bit blurry. A very brain fog is how I would describe it. And actually those things I found really helped, but I don't know if that's something that you share a lot. It depends. You remember when I said, um, spoke about kind of the two different types of anxiety? If you've got kind of conventional stress-induced anxiety, then that is what would be called a grounding technique. If grounding techniques work for you, that's fantastic. You know, the five things you can see, four things you can hear. If that works for you, that's, that's great. Way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's different ones, you know, like box breathing and all these kind of things. If that works, that's great. I don't do it in my practice because it didn't help me when I was obsessing about my anxiety because I had the other type of anxiety. So it depends. Okay. If I've got a client in here who's stressed with work and they don't really have any kind of signs of the disordered inwards anxiety, you know, your panic disorder, agoraphobia, your OCD, health anxiety, those kind of things, then yeah, I perhaps try a grounding technique. Like, have you just tried taking a deep breath? And anything to bring you in the present is a good grounding technique. So they often um, laugh at me because I say, look out the window, how many, uh, how many yellow cars can you see? They're like, they're infantilizing me. I was like, I definitely am. Now, how many yellow cars? Are and it brings you back into the present. Yeah, that can work. If you're someone who's afraid of anxiety itself, fear of fear. I don't do that because what I did do say is my golden rule in my practice is do what non-anxious you would do. You know, so if you're, let's say, out of panic attacks when you drive a car or you're really anxious about driving and you pull over and do box breathing and five things you can see, that actually has the counter, a counter effect because all the brain remembers is that when you got anxious, you had to pull over and escape. You know, if you are afraid to have um, panic and anxiety in a restaurant with your friends, but you walk in, you look for the fire exit or the bathroom to run to, only just in case you panic, then you teach the brain actually anxiety is something to be feared. And if you do that with the disordered kind of stuff, people have horrible intrusive thoughts, you know, violent, sexual, taboo-ridden thoughts. If they kind of stop and have like a ritual or a technique to to counter that that has the opposite effect because you're just teaching the brain that this thought is important so it depends it's, for me i do use again i stop and take a deep breath i do well i do i do 10 breaths when i'm stressed so it's like i can feel stress coming on and i just do 10 mindful breaths and it grounds me and it's really nice but if i'm fearing panic attacks and i'm like oh, just I, I avoid here just in case i panic I avoid this person because they make me anxious. Um, I, I want to, you know, do it. Then no, I do, I do the opposite. And I'm really, it's something I'm really passionate about. It's about what type of anxiety am I trying to address here? Is it an anxiety that's naturally occurring in a very stressful situation? In your situation, yeah, you know, you've got naturally occurring anxiety. You know, I'm worried about my job, I'm worried about the, my income, I'm worried about the state of the industry I'm in. Yeah. But by all means, ground yourself, ground, do stuff, stuff like that. But if you've got anxiety, like, just in the morning, I work so much with morning anxiety, just like, I wake up and just feel anxious for no reason, then I'm like, no, that's when you crack on. You crack on when you do, if that makes sense.
Yeah, it's really interesting. I feel like I relate to all of them in different ways. And different days have different ways of how I feel. And I think it's, I think it's really interesting to take note of that because one is that there's so many things out there that if we Google, we feel, is this right? Is this gonna make it worse? And I feel that's similar with nutrition. A lot of people can kind of be sold supplements that can be actually quite detrimental for them, take things that might upset their gut, might interact with medications. And I feel like it's the same with anxiety is that we try to find that solution, but we can become really confused and that can actually make us more anxious because then we feel like a failure. And I see a lot in my clinic, and I don't know if you see this as well, but big thing that I see when I end up getting to the root of that patient is that they're always wanting to please others. And so they put their own self last, and that can create a lot of anxiety. They then start fearing the fear of failure or the fear of upsetting people, and that then creates them to feel quite anxious. Why do you think so many of us suffer with that? Because I see that quite a lot with my patients that actually when we get to the root of it, a lot of it is that they're fearing failure or feeling that they're going to let people down. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, that's a really good question. And um, that is part of people pleasing or imposter syndrome. I put those two things together. It is an anxious response. It's, it's a specific type of anxiety. For this, I referenced the fight or flight response, but it, it's now had a kind of 21st century hipster upgrade. It's the fight, flight, freeze, or fawn response. Lots of alliterative words there. Fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. Freeze is when we just kind of, you know, well, go through them. Fight is like, I'm having an anxious response. It's gearing me up to fight. So they're the people when they get anxious and irritable, they're drawn to conflict. And you might know people in your life like that. You can be men or women. Flight, as in like, I'm anxious. If you've ever felt the need to escape immediately, run away, that's the flight part of the same response. Freeze is when, if you've ever had a panic, most panic attacks are when you, or anxiety attacks, or, you know, uh, freeze responses where you just kind of, you know, it's freeze on the spot, like I did uh, at work in the pupil referral unit. That was a freeze response. I didn't know that. It's the first time I had one. It's like, a, I'm just completely frozen on the spot. People have a sleep paralysis. That's a freeze Night response terrorists. as well. No, sleep paralysis. Oh, um, yes. You ever heard of that? My friend, my, one of my best friends has Yeah, it. no, got, I have. He's got this demon that uh, that he's so used to now, he just kind of jokes. Possessed. Uh, yeah, yeah, just because you're in this kind of half sleep, uh, hypnagogic state. Anyway, and then the last one you've got is fawn. And this is really important because fawn is, when you're anxious, it's the need to people please or placate someone where you're afraid of their judgment. And mostly for the form response is condition. So if you've grown up and your mum and dad have been a dick and they're really unreasonable and they're really critical, maybe they're abusive, maybe there's conflict in the household, you know, maybe you're on eggshells because they might fly off the, off the wall, then your form response will be conditioned to keep you safe. The best chance for me to feel safe is to placate this person. If you've been in an abusive relationship, this form response can be conditioned. And when I say abusive, most abusive relationships are, are verbal or emotional and coercive. In order to not feel horrible and feel hurt emotionally and physically, I've got to please this person. And that's usually conditioned, um, whether you've been bullied at school, interjected beliefs about yourself on social media, things like that. And what happens is the threat response remembers. It's a bit like if you're bitten by a dog as a child, the threat response will remember that. So the next time you see a dog, you'll feel anxious. And it's only by, you know, walking towards the dog that you train it, the threat response to turn off. That very same threat response is the same for fawning and people pleasing. If I've grown up and all I wanted was the love and affection of my parents, and nothing was, or oh, they did give it, they did give that affection, but only if I got A stars and one sports day and became prom queen or whatever. Yeah, I have a conditional acceptance there from for parents with high expectations. So what happens is I might take that to work in my career. Suddenly I might be looking at my boss and looking for their approval. Suddenly in my relationships, I'm looking to my girlfriend, my boyfriend, whatever, and being like, is that approval? Because that's a fawn response. And you can take that How everywhere. do we get over that, though? How do we actually... I mean, maybe some people are listening to this going, OK, I'm going to try and think about my childhood and my parents or something that happened to me maybe at school, but how do we then initiate 
more of a positive response now. So if we know that that's happened to us, how can we then actually try and action that and rechange our mindset? Uh, by doing what uh, anxiety doesn't want you to do. So this thing's like when boundaries are important. So a good way to stop that is to practice with those boundaries. I love properly reinforced boundaries, not like what someone on Instagram says, like you gotta remember your boundaries. And, and, but like in general, it's like if your boss has been, you know, taking the mickey out of you for a bit too long, expecting you to stay longer hours and you're doing jobs that you didn't sign up for and not part of your contract, they keep giving it you and you're like, yes, yes, because you want to placate authority. A good way to stop doing that is, is to say no. But not only say no, but to, we go back to those words again, but to willfully tolerate the discomfort of saying no. So if friends invite you out and pressure you and you're like, no, I'm all right, I don't want to do that. Saying no is a massive one. The more you do it, the more you teach the brain, just like if a dog bit you, the more you teach the brain that this is actually safe, nothing bad's going to happen. And you need to do it quite a bit and then the brain will start to wire itself. It's all through your behavior. You have to do, be, do it and and do the difficult things but of course then you've got guilt guilt is the most useless emotion there is particularly when it's enmeshed with anxiety put yourself first you know you've got to practice putting yourself first it's not going to feel great at first because you're going to sit there and feel guilty keep doing it guilt and shame but i think so many of us suffer with that i'm not sure that we can always name that feeling actually because we can end up just feeling quite bad about oneself but i feel like guilt and shame is two of the most intense but also misdirectional if that is even a word but emotions that we can experience because it ends up making our self-esteem self-worth just plummet and I think that can stop us from having that constant feeling of saying no I do deserve to say no because I think saying no and I and I know this just from all the conversations that I've had and what I do in clinic on the power of saying no I still struggle with it even though I know it I still cannot always initiate it and Sometimes it just drives me mad where I'm like, just do this. And it's the guilt and the shame that just stops you. Even though I'm rationally telling myself it's fine, it's such a powerful emotion. And I think, how can we actually get past that guilt and shame? Yeah, that's a good point. I appreciate you kind of sharing, sharing your own experiences there as well. But like, for me, pinpointing where the guilt and shame has been constructed is really helpful. More therapy than hot dinners, so I can pin pinpoint a lot of mine a lot of mine survive the guilt and stuff because my brother isn't here and I am and I'm a lazy git doing whatever but I don't think like that anymore pinpointing You're definitely things not like, lazy oh, oh I am and <laughs> just I love pop it. that in there I love it uh, yeah, yeah, I'm motivated by laziness I'll be productive so then I can be lazy later on love it it's like a pet yes but in general yeah it's like pinpoint where your guilt comes from it could be anything. You know, if you've grown up in a very religious household that's perhaps like super orthodox, super to the letter, and maybe you're struggling because you're gay or, or having things that, that go against that maybe, you can pinpoint that kind of guilt. Guilt can come from many places. You know, uh, maybe you feel guilty because you've lost a loved one and maybe there's, a, there's something there and that's not processed. Maybe you feel guilty because, yeah, you're... All your siblings are hard working and teachers pets and you're not and you're not revered as much as them. Maybe you feel guilty because you think it's your fault. Maybe you feel guilty because you don't feel productive enough because that's what you've been conditioned to think since you've been born. You know, your value is your what on what you produce. Whereas I like to teach clients, you know, your value is in your intentions and just your being and your traits. You know, and they're a bit like that's a bit wishy washy. I was like, by the end of this, you'll be, you, 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 you might think differently. First, just pinpoint where do you think it comes from, maybe through therapy. I love therapy. Obviously, get a, a qualified therapist and, and kind of pinpoint where those beliefs originate from. You mentioned a really interesting point there, therapy. And I think, you know, I came from, you know, a very British background growing up, just never having that spoken about. And two very loving parents, but also, you know, would never admit to wanting to have therapy because that just means that you're mad. And then I moved to New York when I was 21 or 20. And I remember sitting around a dinner table, and this is now going back a long time ago. I wish it wasn't as long, but sadly it is. And everyone spoke around having a therapist. And I remember feeling really uncomfortable, really, kind of not, not knowing how I can participate to that conversation. 
which now looking back says a lot about me because I was obviously this like tight upper lip, not really not wanting to show any weaknesses and feeling just quite alienated because I was like, I wouldn't know anyone back home who would talk about this. Like I don't think I know anyone who has a therapist at all. And then obviously going through my own journey and understanding the importance of therapy, talking about it and then being very open about it. And I think the hardest part was trying to talk to my parents about it by just saying, I think everyone should have therapy. It's not, it doesn't mean that you're mad. It doesn't mean that you're mentally ill, you're a bad person or there's something wrong with you. Actually, it's really healthy to talk to someone. And that's how it's viewed in America. And it's sad that everyone here feels very, it's very shameful. And I do think we are changing our opinion on therapy now. Like I feel a lot more people are very open about it. I've actually have a lot of conversations with my inner circle around it. But the one thing that I feel that most people struggle with is they want to maybe see a therapist. They're a bit too scared to maybe talk to people around it or about it or ask for referrals. And then people kind of try to figure out therapy, but there's so many different types. I think people feel quite lost with who they should be seeing and what type of therapy they should be getting. Like, how can you help and what advice can you share with people that maybe go, well, I'd like to see a therapist, but I just don't even know where to start and I don't even know what the right therapy is for me. Yeah, that's a very good question. It's very courageous for people. It shouldn't be courageous, it should just be normal. But, like, it is, I, you know, it's courageous for people to pluck up the courage to seek therapy. Um, this is due to... Uh, very British emotional conservatism. You know, it's that keep calm, carry on. You can still get, you still see that on those posters and mugs. I just want to smash them and burn Every them all because they're so, yeah, they're so interwoven in our, and almost celebrated in our culture. You know, like you're revered on how well you can hide your emotions, which is just stupid considering, you know, like the biggest killer of men under 50 is suicide. So, you know, I mean, that's just frightening. But, you know, keep, keep calm, carry on, lads, let's get on with it. It's just silly. Uh, but yeah, that's it's something that was needed, arguably, in the war. You know, emotional conservatism, we all band together, we get together, we it's life or death. You know, we haven't got any, you know, haven't got time to listen to you about your career and all these things. All right, okay, fair enough. But in general, no, it, it's something that was useful a century ago and isn't really now in general society. And so, yeah, you still see that reverence, like, oh, you know, even then, you know, like, weakness, it's not weakness. I've cried in front of my mates, and if they have a problem with it, I'll knock them all out. There we are. <laughs> it's such a... In general, it's like, it's not, like, it's trying to normalise that the best you can. I recorded myself having a panic attack live on my Instagram. I'm still there, put it on my on my highlights, just to show people, kind of like, you know, this is, this is all right. If you feel like you want to seek therapy, you've realised, actually, I don't feel right, maybe I'm anxious, maybe I'm depressed, maybe I'm having strange intrusive thoughts, things like that. Yeah, well done for considering going to therapy, but then you're right, this, uh, what kind of therapy do I go to? You know, it's not very, it's not very easily explained. It's hard. It's very hard, yeah. So if you struggle with that disordered, horrible anxiety, panic attacks, agoraphobia, things like that, I love CBT or anything of, of CBT-esque. Um, in the UK, you can get it on the NHS. Cognitive. Behavioral therapy, just in case people are like, what's CBT? That's cognitive behavioral therapy, isn't it? Sorry to interrupt. Cognitive behavioral therapy, yeah, yeah. So cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah, it's, it's look, it's kind of short-term therapy that's goal-driven, and there's loads of psychoeducation in there if you get a good therapist. Just a warning as well, not all therapists know what they're doing. Many therapists don't know what they're doing. Loads of therapists are obsessed about the word trauma and just want to pin everything on that, which isn't helpful if you struggle with, say, OCD. If you... I've lost someone, go to person-centered counseling. I love person-centered counseling. It's just a room that's safe and non-judgmental. And you're probably thinking, that makes me feel awkward. And that's the beauty of it. Because when you start to realize that actually you do have a space that's just for you, and this person genuinely listening and cares, that's a wonderful, magical place. That can be long-term therapy. That goes on for a long time. There's different types, acceptance and commitment therapy. That's very kind of CBT-esque. If you struggle in relationships with conflict, relationships with yourself, transactional analysis is a great, it's called TA for short, really good modality, where you're looking at inner child stuff, fun child, adult mode, lecturing parent mode, that kind of thing, it's a really good modality. If you wanna go old school, you can go to psychodynamic therapy, so they picture yourself lying on a therapy bed, dude in a, with elbow patches, leaning against a mahogany bookcase, telling you you wanna shag your mum and kill your dad. 
if you're into that kind of stuff, you know, go to psychedelic. I'm joking, I've minimized it. Psychedelic can be very challenging, feeling. I personally am not a fan of it, but that doesn't mean, you know, I don't have the last say about it. And there's plenty of Jungian therapy, which is psychoanalytical and psychodynamic. That's a bit more modern. There's different types. Well, you can just ask your therapist, what kind of therapy do you do? You know, you'd, you'd ask that about any other trade, wouldn't you? You know, I'm having my drive done now. What kind of drives do you do? You know, ask a therapist, what kind of therapy do you do? And they'll explain to you, hopefully. Like, And if they don't explain or they're being a bit weird. Very important, though, if it doesn't work with your therapist, you don't feel that connection, just leave. I have so many clients that come in here and they feel guilty. They've been with therapists for years and years and years, making no progress, and they think it's their fault that they're making no progress. Like, no, man, like, just try a different therapist. Try a different modality. It's not you failing. And if a therapist ever sells you, you need X amount of sessions for this, 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 that's a red flag, get out. I really agree with that because I've had multitude of different therapists over the years, some that I've really engaged with. There were some therapists where I ended up feeling quite shameful or quite a lot of blame on myself. And I just think I kind of left feeling worse than I went in. And I thought, is that how a therapist is meant to be? And I think it's that navigating, isn't it, of, of actually saying, if you do feel anxious, it can feel quite an anxious to leave. And so I think it's really important actually to recognize that, that actually if it's not working, then you are in control and you can leave and try someone else. But it's having that confidence to then look again and to actually take action on that. Because I think sometimes we might see a therapist and go, oh, it doesn't work, like, therapy doesn't work on me. And I, that's a line that I hear a lot is, therapy doesn't work. And it's probably yeah. because there's only been maybe the wrong people they've gone to. Yeah, it's like saying, oh, I tried sport and I didn't like it. And it's like, all you've played is lawn bowls. No offense to lawn bowls, but you know. Yeah, in general, like to try it a bit. Yeah, it's one of the saddest things I hear is like, I tried therapy, it was rubbish. And usually people waiting on waiting lists for the NHS for 18 months. They get six sessions of 30 minute stuff with someone who's just qualified in a certificate for CBT, you know, watered down stuff because there's a large demand on, on it and stuff. But yeah, in general, if it doesn't work, you know, I remember as well, the therapist is there for you, you're not there for the therapist. As soon as you start having feelings like, I feel like I'm disappointing my therapist, one, tell them, but it could add just kind of part as part of your therapy. And two, if you feel like it's a feeling that doesn't go away, try a different therapist, because that's, you know, you shouldn't be taking that stuff there. And yeah, just try different modalities. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I loved CBT and exposure response prevention for my OCD. But I also really like person-centered counseling when I lost my dad and my brother in a very short amount of time and I just wanted a space to roll around and cry and, and process. It's different. Therapy has different purposes for different issues sometimes. Definitely. And I think, is there any truth in, if you have constant anxiety, you know, there isn't a reason, can that sometimes be a, a red flag to you that there's something within your life that you're quite unhappy about and to act on it? Because I think sometimes we can become quite familiar with that just constant underlining feeling of, fear and so we end up kind of going oh I don't want to leave my job because I'm too afraid that I won't get another job so I'm just going to sit in that job or I don't want to relieve that relationship because I don't want to be alone and I referenced it to one of my friends recently who I think is going through a really hard time she's really struggles to speak about her emotions but she's also too afraid to act on anything as well because of what the outcome could be so there's just this constant state of anxiety where I think actually it's more the situation that's causing it, but the connection to leave is more anxious than staying in it. So I think that's what many people might be able to relate to in situations. And what yeah. would you say in that moment? It could be uh, anticipatory anxiety, which is like you're anticipating having to make a difficult choice, so you're stuck in a sense with this sense of foreboding. Yeah, that, that's kind of your mind and body telling you that this situation isn't sustainable, or you have to take action either to commit to the situation or to take action and, and, and change the situation. If there's a present constant anxiety, it could be for many things or one specific thing that you don't know or there could be a trigger. So if, you, if you've been through trauma or have PTSD and you have, uh, you're working with someone who reminds you of them, they have certain traits of the person who was kind of who abused you, then yeah, your body will stay in a state of anxiety because it's just in case this person, you know, because it reminds you of that threat. It could be because you're just unhappy, yeah. You could be in, in a job you don't like, it sucks, and you're like, I just have this sense of anxiety all day because 
you know, maybe I'm just not happy where I am. It depends, each one. And again, that's why I always say bring attention to therapy, because it's like, unpick it. You know you better than anyone else. And a good therapist will help you to help you find what's going on. So Josh, as we are on the topic of therapy, you are actually writing a book about being a therapist yourself, and it has a fantastic name. Can I share it? Sure. So think about a therapist writing a book and think about what a therapist normally says. How does it make you feel? Is brilliant. Now talk to me about the concept of this book. Talk to me about why you wanted to write it, because I think when many of us think about a therapist, we think they've got it all together. And you're actually kind of debunking that in this book, aren't you? Yeah. So, uh, and how does it make you feel? It's a cliche that we often hear from counsellors. It's a book I've written in order to get people into therapy, uh, normalise it, peek into the uh, into the staff room of therapists and the, into the mysterious world. And it documents me being a therapist working with four clients with different anxious presentations. Obviously, they're fictionalised. Uh, but really interesting characters that come with different problems. I won't reveal, but it's very, very uh, interesting. And during it, one of the um, unique parts of the book is that it, the voices in my head often shout out when I'm in therapy, 10, 12 different voices, like some are compassionate, some are critical, some are analytical, some are just bizarre, and some are like biology voices and stuff. Yeah, I just the thought, you know, I combined all that into create like a, it's like half comedy, half psychoeducation. I want to normalize just therapy and do it in a way that actually, yeah, look, you know, therapists are human and uh, I'll, I'll show you why. It is actually that, isn't it? It's, it's constructing that concept, but we all have these moments where we're not this polished version of ourselves. And it can be so hard to admit that, especially when you're kind of foreseen as that power image that you are the person who's going to help that other person make it all better so you there can't have any faults of your own or any worries or voices in your head because you you're meant to have it all together yeah do not have it all together absolutely not because no human really has it all together we all have our troubles and vices and you'll see plenty in the book (laughs) could you kind of tell me about one funny moment in the book where you reference that in the first draft you know it starts from the um I'm in the therapy room and having a therapeutic breakthrough with a client. I've been waiting for weeks and weeks and weeks for this client to realise it. It's doing really well. And meanwhile, for the last 10 minutes, I desperately need the toilet. I need a wee. And so all I've got is that this guy is telling me stuff and I've got an argument in my head between my compassionate voice, like, yes, he's going to break through, and then my biology voice is saying, why, you know, your bladder is going to explode, your prostate is on fire. And then, on the, and then another one, and then I got the critical voice saying, why did you neck an Americano before the session, you idiot? And stuff like that. And all this chatter is going on. And it's chatter that everyone can relate to, really. And, um, you know, but the internal battle between really caring about this client, but also I don't want to run out at this really important time. To, um, to take a leak so yeah that's just, just that's just a little snippet of kind of to finish up you are writing a new book I mean it literally sums up a therapist how does it make you feel cliche and how does it make you feel and it, yeah it's about me with four fictional clients with different anxious presentations various things going on there very interesting clients and characters as well and it's about me working with them in the therapy room and put all the voices that are happening in my head during it so it's like 10 different voices, like funny voices, critical voices, analytical voices. It's, it's really kind of, um, it's due out in about a year. I think 2024 is the a release date. It could be earlier. But yeah, I just finished the first draft. Then I'm going to do the edits, they suggest. And then, yeah, it should, should, should be out there, yeah. Can't wait to go into like Waterstones and pick it off the, pick it off the, probably be, you know, the front there. That'd be really nice. I've always wanted to do that such a big thing to write a book and it and so much hard work goes into it but I think that title of how does it make you feel is such a brilliant title for a therapist and I think you do have a therapist voice so I hope you do an audio book because it would yeah. be well I've got a great. few out there yeah I've got a few out there and, and I've got an anxiety podcast for people with disordered anxiety as well uh, my friends always joke like you know I didn't get through it all because it sent me to sleep implying I was boring not relaxing but there you go <laughs> 
But I do love that you debunk this myth, which I think many people can have the fear of. Because going into a therapy room, you are vulnerable, okay? You're kind of putting all of your deepest, darkest worries, your fears, everything that you think is crazy in your mind, you're like letting it out. And so it becomes a very vulnerable moment, but a very intimate moment, I think, with your therapist as well. You may be saying things in that room that you've never said out loud before. And I do think many people have this misconception that therapists just have it all together. They're just this like perfectly formed human being that has no problems. <laughs> and I love that you're basically talking through this book about all of your thoughts that are going through your mind that are like rational, irrational, crazy, funny. Like what yeah. kind of drove you to want to write about that? I want more people to kind of go to therapy and be aware of therapy as well and how it can present. It's a mysterious world, isn't it? People just think, oh, you know, you're psychoanalyzing me and all that kind of stuff. No one really knows much, a lot about it. And I just wanted to provide people a peek into it. Also, I'm quite an irreverent therapist as well. I probably don't represent the conventional therapist. Don't get me wrong, I practice to high standards and I hold ethics very close to me, but I also believe a good therapist is themselves and shows a lot of themselves. And that's what you'll find in the book. It's balancing professionalism with I'm human. Because I think when you realize that your therapist is human, it eradicates a horrible power dynamic. There's always a power dynamic there being a therapist, but in general, yeah, I think it narrows that gap of that power dynamic to make you feel less scared to go talk about things. Yeah, just silly things in there, you know, like pouring sauce on myself before a session or a client seeing me on a night out or, you know, things like that. You, you, you know, you just normal things. God, that reminds me of like you saw a teacher on a night out when you were younger and you were like, wait, they're real, they drink, they go out. Oh yeah. I remember seeing quite a few of my professors at uni on nights out in London and just kind of really referencing that and thinking, wait, they shouldn't be out. <laughs> they shouldn't oh, I be went, out I, I went, I went drinking with my pro professors and lecturers, they're great, yeah. Oh, I love that, yeah. I didn't have that relationship with mine. So a few things that I wanna leave on and these are gonna be quick fire questions if you're okay with that, so. No, but go ahead. <laughs> If you can, yeah, I'm not taking no for an answer. Um, I'm not creating that boundary. Um, quick five <laughs> questions. One line answer, if you can. Okay, what is the one thing that we don't know about you that would surprise us? I get, I hear this every time. I'm six foot two. So everyone's like, you're taller than I thought. I laugh because I didn't think you were going to answer that question. That's, that's, <laughs> that, like... Oh, gosh. Yeah, yeah I'm, six, I'm, taller, I'm taller than I look on camera. Sound like a desperate okay, like, like dating dating video, doesn't it? Like, I'm taller than I look on camera. <laughs> yeah. How do you make sure you keep up your own happiness levels? By giving myself permission to be selfish now and then. What inspires you today? My brother and wanting to make all the suffering into something worthwhile and beautiful. What is the funniest thing you've ever heard? I don't know, there's so many funny things. And I don't wanna just grab the, the nearest one and say that's the funniest thing I've ever heard because then it might be like six out of 10 funny. And I was like, is that, the, is that what he defines as humor? That six out of 10 mean or whatever that he did. I, the, fu the funniest thing I've ever heard is that question. There we are. I was like. <laughs> <laughs> don't mirror that back on me. I'm a therapist, <laughs> I will. And I'm really you good at it. You will mirror that back on me. <laughs> I'm highly uh, I, I, aware of what you're doing there. Uh, oh, I, I went to see I went to see Stuart Lee um, at Salford Keys, and he was really funny. There we go. Uh, he was the funniest, one of the funniest things I've heard. There we go. Okay, great. I'm gonna check him out. And what does? So this is what I leave all my guests the same question with: Is Josh, what does live well, be well mean to you? Live well means doing things that you enjoy not copying an archetype. Take inspiration from people and use that inspiration to form your own, dare I say this, path through life. But make sure it's yours. You know, don't walk down someone else's, another platitude, but genuinely mean it. It's when you try to emulate someone's life, it stops because being yours. Living well and being well is following your life, making your own decisions, be healthy, but balance it with fun as well and hedonism. You know, just 
yeah, you're here once, unless you believe in reincarnation. You know, just go easy on yourself. Don't listen to guilt. Uh, and trust that your intentions are good. Value yourself on intentions as well and not output because that's so annoying when that happens. So yeah, that's what live well, be well means to me. You say that with such worry at the end. <laughs> like, it's, like I'm going to say, yeah, that's wrong. <laughs> no, that was fantastic. I think, you know, I had, and I don't know if I said this to you last week, but I had this moment I, was, I got a bicycle and I was going through Hyde Park on one of those electric bikes. And I just had this realisation in my mind that we're actually not here for that long. And I think I was probably just having an anxious day or an anxious moment or just kind of going through all these things that on my to-do list that I really need to do and feeling like I'm not doing them quick enough. And I just had this moment where I was like, God, I'm really not going to be here for this long. And is this what I'm going to spend my day worrying about all the time, about to do the to-do list or worrying about how quickly I'm doing something like actually it was a really weird deja vu moment but it just kind of hit me and I think that's a really big thing it's like actually just making sure you can enjoy it to what's important to you than trying to navigate it into what you should be doing absolutely separate those to-do lists for I shoulds I want tos do your shoulds leave the I want tos for now and um oh yeah the existential dread always hits you out of nowhere <laughs> Josh, thank you so much, first of all, for coming on the podcast, and secondly, for coming back on the podcast a week later because we couldn't capture the first recording. So, fingers crossed, this one works. So, where can everyone find you? Because I know you've got a podcast and you've got other books out there and the School of Anxiety. So, I'd love, I've obviously put this in the show notes, but I'd love for you to direct all of the listeners and where they can find out more about you. Yeah, uh, I've got a podcast myself called The Panic Pod. Um, Anxiety Josh on social media, or just type in Joshua Fletcher on Google, you'll find me. Yeah, I've got lots of self-help books and stuff out there. If you struggle with really bad anxiety, it's written from perspective of someone who's been very anxious in the past, and um, but also as a therapist. Um, yeah, Anxiety Josh, the Panic Pod, and the School of Anxiety is just basically what I've moved everything underneath. So I do like courses and things like that. And uh, newsletters and stuff like that. But yeah, it's all it's all there. You can just type the name. And if you follow Josh on Instagram, you'll also see a sausage dog, which is my favourite. Yeah, not favourite. Captain, about Stru your Instagram, Captain but Struder will be making him. more um, appearances. Amazing. Well, I will pop all of that in the show notes. And um, Josh, best of luck with the book. I hope it goes really well. And thank you so much for coming on to Live Well Be Well today. Thank you. Uh, thank I appreciate you inviting me. I've, uh, I've had a lovely time. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Live Well, Be Well. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please can I ask one huge favor. If you could subscribe, share and rate this podcast, it would mean an immense amount to me and all the fantastic guests who come on to share their expertise and knowledge with us. It will keep this podcast growing and it will allow us to continue making episodes. Until next week, I hope you all live well and be well.